Namaskar and welcome to Indian Diplomacy, show on uh, Doordarshan, India's national broadcaster about uh, Indian foreign policy, India's uh, international relations and also regional and global developments that have an impact on India's rise. Viewers, in this episode, we are taking up the theme of the Indo-Pacific, a construct that has uh, come of age in recent years and uh, has become very central and defining feature to uh, politics and international relations in Asia and beyond. And to discuss the uh, geopolitics of the Indo-Pacific, I have a specialist, uh, an esteemed scholar with me joining uh, in the studio. Let me introduce you to him, Professor David Kepi. Hi, nice to join you. Professor Kepi uh, is a professor of international relations at the Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand and is director of uh, strategic studies there and a well-known expert on geostrategic and geopolitical issues. Uh, Professor KP, uh, welcome to Indian Diplomacy. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here and have the chance to talk. So, um, Indo-Pacific, uh, we have all been following it you know, very closely uh, and you see the way it's evolved in the last 15 years since it was first conceived by the late uh, Shinzo Abe mm -hmm. of Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you see it coming of age, as I said in the introduction? I mean, do you think it's really matured or do you think there's still a question mark about the viability of this concept? A lot of uh, countries in the region, uh, David, have been announcing their own Indo-Pacific outlooks. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that gives us some uh, belief that the idea has caught on and that the notion that the confluence of the two seas, as Shinzo Abe put it, is now a reality, uh, a geopolitical reality and also uh, probably an economic and commercial reality uh, given the you know in interconnections of the two sides across the Malacca mm. Straits, east and west. So how would you rate the, the, the journey of this idea of the Indo-Pacific? Yeah, look, that's a great question. And I think you're absolutely right. As you said in your opening remarks, this is, is a, re a concept that's come of age. It doesn't seem very long ago that the idea of the Asia Pacific was the description we'd hear for the region. But the, the rise of Indo-Pacific as a strategic construct has been incredibly rapid and has spread widely. But what I would say is there are very different Indo-Pacifics. Uh, as you said, lots of different countries have uh, rolled out over the last 10 years or so uh, uh, concepts or strategies that they attach the label of Indo-Pacific to. Mm. Uh, and we can think, for example, about the very important role uh, of Prime Minister Abe and, that, and Japan played in resurrecting Indo-Pacific uh, after almost a sort of 10-year gap in 2016. Um, when mm. we had Prime Minister Modi give a, give a speech at the Shangri-La Dialogue in, in 2018, he talked about not just a free and open Indo-Pacific, but a free, open and inclusive yeah. uh, Indo-Pacific, which I think was... Um, very um, compelling language for a range of small and middle-sized powers around the region as well. And then, of course, more recently, we've had ASEAN offer its own 2019, its ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, mm. which also embraces that concept of uh, inclusivity, mm. not drawing lines um, between who's in and who's out. And also, I think, puts a bit more, uh, less emphasis on maybe the hard balancing, the strategic side of things, and more emphasis on connectivity uh, uh, and uh, on economic development. And then if that mm. wasn't enough, we can look outside the region. And we've seen in Europe, Europe has a strategy, yeah. the EU, um, the Netherlands, Germany. So it's certainly an idea that's, uh, um, that's taken hold. Um, but I think people mean slightly different things by the concept when they use it. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah. it's it, this. It, I mean, it's been a phenomenal success. And David, um, you talked about um, how the idea has emerged, and if you think about it, there is this notion of a community, or of a, you know having a common security architecture, and that's often spoken about as the goal of this Indo-Pacific idea. Mm. Um, and then on the other hand. There are the detractors, or uh, China especially, believes that this is a bad idea and that this is actually a Western implant and mm. it's meant to divide the region into multiple blocks and camps. Yeah. So, um, do you think, I mean, and the Chinese say that this, by advancing the idea of Indo-Pacific, it's actually increasing the instability and the uh, conflicts in the region, and that's how they put it. Yeah. But we, uh, most of us, uh, especially democratic countries in the region, think that this is community building and that the common architecture is coming about. So you think, I mean, let me ask you a big, uh, you know, mm -hmm. big ticket question. Yeah. Is Indo-Pacific good for stability in the region or is it actually increasing instability, you think? Well, I mean, I think partly it depends on um, 
less about the concept itself and more about how it's actually implemented and, and actualized. Uh, and I think you um, you raised a very good um, a very good point about the c concerns that China's raised uh, about this over over the over a number of number of years. Wang Yi famously said that um, the Indo-Pacific was an idea that would be like foam on a wave that would disappear, and mm. clearly that hasn't been the case. It's stuck around and and proved that it's got resonance. Um, but I think when it comes to this question of architecture, there I think the Indo-Pacific still has some work to do to flesh out the concept with some actually some meaningful forms of cooperation. So, so for example, we could look at the Quad, which has certainly evolved um, uh, and, um, from it doesn't seem very long t a long time ago that it was sensitive for relatively junior officials to meet and now we have regular meetings of, of leaders and, and ministers and that's become routinized. Um, we have frameworks like AUKUS between Australia, the UK and the United States, which is sometimes considered to be a kind of embryonic Indo-Pacific concept. Mm. And then we've got frameworks like uh, IPEF, the US economic idea to give it some, uh, to put some economic flesh on the bones of Indo-Pacific. But I think the critics would look at something like IPEF and say and compare it to to the big inclusive um, free trade arrangements in, in the region, TPP, CPTPP and RCEP. Awesome and say, where's the economic vision? Um, so I think that, um, that, 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 you know, that, that connect connectivity of the Indian Ocean and, 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 and maritime East Asia is real and there, but the, 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 the architecture around that, the cooperative architecture mm. that would give substance to the community you, that you talked about, I think that that's, um, that's still to be developed. And in fact, the, the still, notwithstanding its faults, the, um, the, the architecture, that the, the institutions that are sort of have the widest legitimacy remain those ASEAN-centered uh, institutions, the EAS, the ARF, uh, and so on. Yeah, yeah. So viewers, uh, what Professor KP is saying, it's a work in progress, and uh, there's much that we will need to uh, build further uh, for the Indo-Pacific to be fully realized. But uh, let me take you to the central geopolitical division uh, that defines this region, which is the big power rivalry between China and the United States. Let's uh, hear from the commander of the Indo-Pacific command of the U.S. Uh, military, uh, Admiral John Aquilino, talking in Singapore about the American vision for the Indo-Pacific. Let's just uh, uh, hear him and then continue the discussion. First and foremost, the United States is not seeking conflict in the Indo-Pacific region. Rather, we embrace the rules-based international order, freedom of navigation throughout the global commons, human rights, and the peaceful settlement of disputes utilizing the rule of law. Second, we do not seek to contain the People's Republic of China. As stated in U.S. strategy, however, we are engaged in a robust competition. Third, the United States has not changed our policies toward Taiwan, and we do not support Taiwan independence. We do, however, support peace and prosperity and stability in the Pacific, free of coercion and bullying. So when I look at the environment across this region and across the globe, I believe the world has evolved from an era of globalization in which economies drove geopolitics, and it's changing to an era of renewed great power competition where the security environment influences economics, trade, and investment. But. Competition doesn't mean no friction, nor does it mean we will acquiesce to every demand. So, the United States is a Pacific nation. We always have been, and we will continue to fly, sail, and operate anywhere international law allows to demonstrate the freedom of navigation rights of all nations. We actively defend these freedoms because the international rules-based order and the rule of law are foundational to be stability and prosperity. So viewers, uh, you heard the Indo-Pacific uh, commander of the U.S. military saying we don't want 
conflict and we don't see containment of China. Uh, coming back to Professor KP, uh, David, you saw uh, what the Americans are saying and here they say they don't want conflict, uh, but then they say they are here to defend certain principles mm -hmm. and certain uh, <coughs> values. And uh, you hear a lot of this kind of, uh, you know, official uh, statements from many of the countries in the region, including Quad members, that this is not just to contain China, it's not an anti-China alliance, but uh, it's something broader and we're just maintaining the institutions and the rules uh, for the maritime spaces. Um, now, how, I mean, how do you think this is just uh, sugarcoating the, you know, the, the reality is simply essentially is that China's rise is the central problem and therefore we are all coming together? Or do you think, I mean, our foreign minister has, for, uh, for example, said that we must have a, the Quad countries, for example, must have a constructive and a positive agenda mm. and it's not just anti-China. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and you are from one of the smaller countries in the region, New Zealand. So looking at the region, uh, you have this big power confrontation, but there's, they're saying it's not really out, uh, outright containment. Mm. So how would the region, how should the region respond to this kind of uh, dialectic that you're seeing? Yeah, uh, look, I think um, um, Admiral Aquilino was making a number of points in, in that address. One, I think there was an element of uh, to some extent reassurance towards China. We're not seeking to contain China. We're not seeking independence for Taiwan. Um, but at the same time, laying down very firmly and very clearly that the US sees a set of foundational principles, freedom of navigation and so on, that it won't, uh, that it won't step back from. And that really is the nub of, of the crux in some ways, in that uh, you, uh, it, w at what point does competition uh, and at what point does, does standing up for these important, uh, very important foundational values that are important, not just to, big, not just to the United States, but very, uh, freedom of navigation, respect for law of the sea, respect for UN conventions. Those are also uh, hugely important to a whole range of, of small and middle powers in Southeast Asia and also uh, in my part of the world in, in the South Pacific. Those are the, the rules which give countries their exclusive economic zones and in some cases give them most of those resources. So those are important principles and I think uh, uh, they're uh, principles to stand up for. However, I think one of the challenges is at what point does competition, uh, how do we prevent that from spilling over into confrontation and, and ultimately conflict? Mm. And I think one of the other things that um, has come up regularly, um, uh, Admiral Aquilino I think mentioned it, Secretary Austin talked about it in his speech at the Shangri-La Dialogue uh, earlier this year. Um, is this importance of having some sort of guardrails, having some sort of clear uh, understandings, uh, some clarity, some, uh, and even as simple as actual lines of communication, mm. so that we don't end up in a situation where a, a, two, a ship is exercising freedom of navigation and gets into a, a situation with a, with a PLA vessel, for example, and we end up with a, with a collision, a conflict that can spiral into a, a war and a conflict that no one wants to see. So sorting out those guardrails, mm. having the two countries understand what their key interests and red lines are is really important. And one of the real dangers at the moment, I think, is that the two countries at the, the levels of communication, they've come back a bit at the political level, but at the military level, I think there's still a lot more that we'd, we will want to see in terms of uh, open lines of, of exchange. Yeah, so strategic uh, stability and communication, the things that we saw during the original Cold War probably are missing in this new Cold War. I couldn't agree more. And I mean... You know, for a lot of the last two decades, there's been a line that actually a lot of the old confidence building measures that we used to see in the Cold War in Europe, they're not appropriate for, for Asia. It's a different mm. kind of strategic environment. But I think we're getting to the point now where the, the competition between the US and China is so sharp, particularly around Taiwan, particularly in the waters around maritime East Asia, that going back and looking at some of those old Cold War confidence building measures, hotlines, transparency, uh, notification of exercises, those sorts of things could be a, a force for stability. Yeah. Coming to New Zealand now, I mean, mm. uh, I've read the new uh, defense uh, policy and strategy statement that's come out. Uh, they are saying that um, New Zealand, a small country <laughs> in the region, uh, is likely to play a more strategic role than it was before. And there is a perception among observers that New Zealand has moved from being uh, focused or consumed wholly by the South Pacific 
uh, and is now looking at the broader Indo-Pacific. Mm -hmm. Would you say that there is some kind of an emergence? And if so, why? I mean, uh, we've been reading about the Chinese interference operations and other efforts to try and manipulate uh, domestic mm -hmm. uh, affairs within your country, just as, as they have done next door in Australia. So there seems to be some kind of a backlash uh, against all this. And is that part of the reason why uh, you are revising and rethinking your strategic postures? Yeah. Well, I think there's a number of different reasons that, that are behind this defence policy review that's come out. Um, I think the first one that, it, that makes it quite clear, not just in that, in that document, but also in, a, for example, our Ministry of Foreign Affairs put, put out uh, a strategic assessment. Mm. They paint a picture of a much more worrying strategic landscape for a small country like New Zealand. Globally, uh, we've seen a, uh, the reassertion of power politics uh, and with the war in Ukraine and so on, the use of coercion by big powers in, in the Indo-Pacific. For a small country, that's really troubling and really worrying, but also big changes on the economic agenda, ec global economic agenda as well, and I think there's a realization for New Zealand that it has to has to do has to do more, mm. that it has to invest more in defence. We've had a, a pretty modest level of investment, to put it mildly, for a long time. Put a lot of faith in multilateral institutions, and I think that um, a number of developments in the last few years have shown that there, there's only so much we can expect them to do to to to, to provide security. So I think it. First of all, it paints a much more worrying picture of the strategic environment, and it, including in our home region, the South Pacific. Mm. And for a long time, I think New Zealand used to think that hard security issues, potential war and conflict was something that happened far out in, in maritime Asia. And in the Pacific, the kinds of security challenges that we had to deal with were primarily around uh, humanitarian assistance, disasters responding to riots and so on. But I think what we've seen over the last few years is that strategic competition has firmly come home to the South Pacific. Yeah. Uh, we've seen um, the People's Republic of China looking to ink um, security arrangements with Pacific states being yeah, uh, Solomon Islands, Solomon Islands yeah, um, and, and also um, and trying to um, arrange multilateral deals around policing and security. Uh, and I think for New Zealand, that uh, the idea that a, a, a big authoritarian uh, state that doesn't share a lot of our interests and values, that would seek to have a permanent, you know, a military or security presence in the Pacific, is really troubling. Mm. Now, so but so in that way, one I think what the Defence Review does, does is a couple of things. One, is it says New Zealand needs to think you know, very seriously about its home region, that that's no longer a place where it's just about cyclones and disasters. It's also about uh, you know, serious challenge, uh, security challenges. So there's a lot, there is a degree of um, uh, an emphasis and importance on starting with the Pacific. Mm. But at the same time, there's a recognition that a lot of those challenges are coming from the wider Indo-Pacific. And so it very much says New Zealand also has to play a part in, in collective security globally. Uh, and that means, Absolutely. you know, being present in the South China Sea, playing a role in elsewhere in the world, and, and hopefully also uh, connecting uh, uh, to India and in, in a greater way as well. Right. So, uh, viewers, uh, what Professor David K.P. is saying is that focusing only on um, human security or softer uh, aspects of security is probably not sufficient for any country uh, in this era of uh, intense geopolitical rivalries. Uh, and hard security, balance of power, all these things really matter. And uh, every country uh, will have to uh, join hands to be able to restore some kind of balance in the region. Uh, and we were talking of India now, coming to the Indian as, uh, perspective. Uh, we have been enthusiastic about the idea of the Indo-Pacific, and uh, we have been uh, expected to step up uh, as providers, net providers of security to the region by a lot of smaller countries. Here's a video about the growing Chinese expansionism that we've already been talking about and what role India could potentially play as a provider of security in this uh, environment in the Indo-Pacific. Let's watch this and then continue the discussion. China is aggressively trying to increase its influence in the Indo-Pacific region, which is home to nearly 65% of the world's population. According to the Observer Research Foundation, ORF, China's rise as an economic and military powerhouse has resulted in a tectonic shift in the power balance. ORF research indicates that managing the rise of a tactfully aggressive China will be critical for the safety, security, and stability of the Indo-Pacific. 
And while the majority of the countries in the Indo-Pacific region are now facing territorial conflicts with China, they find India, Australia, and Japan as emerging power centers who can both challenge and check China's ambitionist and expansionist plans. China's expansionist agenda was established in 2013 by President Xi Jinping with the launch of the Belt and Road Initiative, BRI. To date, 147 countries have signed on to BRI projects or indicated an interest in doing so. However, many of these countries are now concerned that China is using BRI funds to gain influence and control and that they are falling into a debt trap. Beijing's expansionism is not only a threat to its neighbors, but the entire Indo-Pacific region and other countries. India's efforts to contain China will not only benefit India and her citizens, but the broader Indo-Pacific region as well. So viewers, a lot of expectations about India uh, rising to the occasion. India has an activist policy that's meant to uh, operationalize many of these expectations. Uh, so coming back to Professor KP, um, looking at India from down under, from hmm. where you are, um, how does how would you assess India's you know active participation in Quad and the Indo-Pacific, and what does the region want more you know from India? Hmm. What do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, you can't help but be impressed by the um, the level of ambition and visibility that India has taken up in the, in the last decade or, or so in terms of its engagement in in re broader regional. Um, um, uh, proposals and, and, and architecture, the, as you said, a, a, a key pivotal member of the Quad. And, and my sense also in, in the Quad that India has been one of the members that has actually pushed it to take on some of these broader uh, goals, to take mm -hmm. on some of these international public goods rather than just being focused on a, on a harder security agenda. So I think that's, um, you know, that, that's um, um, very, very important. In terms of what, sm what small countries might see for, um, for India as a net security provider, um, I think it's, uh, India has been a, a very important voice for the global south, I think, and we've seen in the, in the lead up to the G20, the articulation of some key interests that small developing states have around uh, debts, public um, digital infrastructure, mm. uh, and so on. I think that, that part of that agenda is, is, is really important to, to, rem to remind ourselves about. Um, and um, I think if I think about this part of the world, one of the th uh, uh, before uh, coming here to, uh, to Delhi, I was in Sri Lanka for, mm -hmm. for some time. And one of the things that you can't help but be struck by there uh, as Sri Lanka wrestles with coming out of its financial crisis is just how important India's role was in, in, in quick and rapid and nimble in responding to that crisis. Um, and that's a key way of providing security as well. I guess mm -hmm. if, I, uh, if I went to, to my part of the world, to the South Pacific, where India is also stepping up its level of engagement and, and involvement, there I think India has a really important role to play in areas like climate change uh, and technology, uh, in development assistance. But one of the things I think that's really important, as India and indeed other like-minded players get more involved in the Pacific, mm -hmm. is that they increasingly engage with the institutions mm -hmm. that are in the Pacific, and, and in particular the Pacific Island Forum, as the kind of central hub for coordinating that external in engagement. Because if that architecture breaks down, uh, then it provides opportunities for other players to come in whose interests might not be, uh, might not be quite the same. Yeah, like ASEAN, I think with the Pacific Islands also, we're mm. trying to consolidate <coughs> all those uh, small island nations. I think there are 14 of them. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to bring them together and to create a common vision and shared perspectives for maritime security and for the region. And in fact, we uh, noted that the New Zealand Prime Minister, Chris Hipkins, actually met Prime Minister Narendra Modi in Papua, Papua New, New Guinea. Guinea. Yeah. Uh, so, and that was an interesting uh, confluence because you have historically had a presence in the, in the Pacific and uh, you're also closely allied with Australia on this matter. Yes. And on the other hand, India is coming in that uh, uh, into your backyard, quote unquote, but in a way that's being welcomed because we all need to collectively shore up this region. Yeah, I mean, there are huge development needs in the Pacific. The Pacific Island states themselves have said that their number one security issue, the thing they're most concerned about, is climate change. It's an existential threat to some of those countries. And there are huge development needs in terms of 
climate mitigation and protecting uh, infrastructure and, and, and low-lying countries. So there's a real need for, and, and the extent to which India can bring development assistance and technological expertise to the region is, is absolutely uh, is welcome. But I think the key thing, as I said, is to make sure that all those countries are coordinating through uh, regional architecture, the, the key one being the Pacific Island Forum, which mm. the forum itself has said is the best way to coordinate and make sure that those investments are um, make, doing the maximum possible good. Last word on ASEAN, uh, you've written and uh, studied it very mm. closely, and we all talk about ASEAN centrality in the Indo-Pacific, yeah. but like in the Pacific Islands, you find that, you know, there is a so-called pro-China camp and then there's a pro-Western and a pro-India, you know, they're all mm. uh, scattered a bit. So when we say, you know, shoring up the architecture, uh, what do you think will unite all of them? Climate change, definitely. Uh, maritime domain awareness, a few of the security related areas also probably will help uh, give them more confidence and debt, you know, the issue of public finance <coughs> and debt uh, in these countries with infrastructure. These are the key, isn't it? The Pacific or ASEAN? For both, for both. For both. Well, I think, um, I mean, I think that uh, ASEAN centrality is, uh, what's really important to the ASEANs is avoiding being dominated by any one of the big powers. And I think ultimately, while they're, be they're having some real challenges right now in terms of dealing with the crisis in Myanmar, dealing with those pressures from outside great powers, I do think that deep down underlying that, uh, the sense that if they don't hang together, they're going to really struggle separately and be picked off, I think will propel ASEAN together. But there's no doubt that ASEAN centrality is going through a, a little bit of a challenging um, period right now. In, in, the, in the Pacific, I think the key thing is Pacific, Pacific Island states themselves have said what they think the key security agenda is, climate change and them worrying about uh, strategic competition. Um, but so I think the, the most important so I think on, on that agenda, the so-called Blue Pacific agenda, they've got a vision. They want to work with, uh, with outsiders. They want to work, but in a way that respects that they're sovereign states that can exercise their own mm. choices, that nobody tells them you can't deal with this country. Um, but um, for countries like New Zealand, I think the, the, the objective is to be a partner of choice. Mm. So the Pacific Island states look around and they say, we want to work with New Zealand right. because it's... Uh, uh, so, so viewers, um, this conversation is uh, showing us that there's so much that we could um, do for the region provided we listen to all the voices. And Professor David Kepi was talking about inclusive, uh, idea of inclusive uh, Indo-Pacific is central, and that's where we need to uh, be, um, you know, observant of the preferences and the interests of uh, the smallest of countries. And that's how we can really build this community and make it stable and prosperous. And uh, that's where I think the real challenge is because uh, there are big powers vying for influence, but then every little country matters and we need to focus on each of them. I want to thank Professor David K.P. for uh, his extraordinary insights into this subject. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. So viewers, uh, Indo-Pacific is work in progress and uh, there are many, many pillars to it. Security is only one of them. So we need to have this holistic vision and approach to the Indo-Pacific and uh, to bring it to fruition. Uh, it already has been a success uh, as we heard from our guest today, but uh, there's much greater challenge uh, that lies ahead uh, given the geopolitical tussles and it's very important that we are able to create this uh, shared community around uh, shared values. Uh, let's think about the Indo-Pacific and what more India can do about it. I'll see you again next time. Until then, take care.